Faith Church. I welcome you in the name of our living Lord Jesus Christ who is present in this place to be worshipped and adored. Thank you for being here on a wonderful snowy Mother's Day morning. We wanted uh, all the moms and grandmas and great-grandmas to stand and let us acknowledge you on your very special day. If you would do that. Thank you. Please take the friendship heads in the center and the side aisles in the moment. We will greet uh, the, the uh, bold warriors who are here this morning. And uh, you know, you never know about Colorado weather, huh? Missionaries of the week are Jack and Colleen LaPetra with New Life Church, uh, New Life in Christ Church, excuse me, in Lakewood. We can read more about that in the bulletin. And um, the Women of Faith retreat is next week. Good thing it wasn't this weekend. And um, how many women are going? Does anybody know? 22, okay? And um, the scholarship offering will be taken this morning uh, on, uh, for to help the ladies defray the cost. And you're supposed to plan scholarships offerings on a non-snow day. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, well, who knew? Who knew? And then Steve Hill and I leave on Friday morning for our trip to China with English Language Institute. Appreciate your prayers. If you'd like to make a donation to do that, just put China Trip on a check. China mission trip. Third Sunday potluck next Sunday. I won't be sharing it with you, but the fellowship will be great. Then just so you know, the congregational meeting, the annual meeting will be Sunday, June 7th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, in the chapel this year. And a reminder, please no food or drink in the uh, sanctuary. Okay. Continue to be the friendliest church in town. Let's stand and greet one another.
justice, the light of your love shine brightly upon them as your love shines brightly through them as well too, Lord. And Father, we thank our many graduates from high school and college now, our friends of graduation, and we thank for good hard work and being with them and their families through this whole process, guide them as they plan for the future as well, Lord Jesus, too. And we thank for a wonderful celebration as we gather Thursday for National Day of Prayer of more than over 43,000 gatherings around the United States, Lord. And we thank for Jerry Schimmel and his faithful witness to you, sharing about his life and how he came to you as a result of the plane crash and the aftermath of that. And thank for his clear proclamation of the gospel, too. And thank for many who led us in worship, and it was a time of really lifting up your name, Lord Jesus. And we do come before you this morning as your people to humble ourselves, to turn from our wicked ways, and ask that you will heal our land, Lord Jesus, as well, Lord. I lift up Mike and Beth Nelson are back in the uh, Twin Cities, visiting with uh, Mike's mother, who's 94 years old and very ill, and probably just ready to go into your presence, Lord. And we know she knows and loves you. And just give her peace. Let their time be very sweet together as a family as well, too, Lord. Father, thank you for watching over many in our congregation. We thank you for Rich Kanopka being on new medication, and his blood uh, chemistry is coming, and it's looking very, very good at this time, too. And we ask you to just continue to touch him the healing presence as well. Thank you for watching over Tad Stewart, who had an incident with his heart and was hospitalized for a while with AFib, and thank that Tad is doing better, continue to strengthen the healing power as well, too. And Wayne Parker, now as a pacemaker, continue to bless and strengthen with the power of your Holy Spirit as well, too. And for Donnie Wise, had an injection. Father, we ask that that will give her release of pain in her back and just be healing and wholeness upon her as well. Keep her safe. We rejoice that Dave Walters' chemo is has finished the long, extensive portion of it, and he's done very, very well. He's battling now the bladder infection, but doing well, and thank for watching over him. And for many others, we'll be having procedures and things at this time, too, and uh, watch over and protect them as your choice servants as well, Lord. We thank for wonderful opportunities to gather together as your people. Thank the men who had fellowship yesterday morning for breakfast. We lift up the women who will be heading up on their retreat this next weekend. We ask the good good weather and safety and travel and just each lady can get there safely to enjoy a wonderful weekend in your presence lord and fellowship with others and anoint those who'd be leading the teaching as well too lord jesus and we thank you too for our growth groups we thank for our koinonias and the prime timers the jeremiah gals the choir and the circles and many bible studies we have for our men and women and for our students as well opportunities to come together as your people to learn and grow about you and to share your love, Lord Jesus. We thank you for our outreaches, Lord, through every home for Christ. The Shekinah went to over 60 apartments uh, near Dayton Avenue and 11th Avenue, and they had 10 people pray to receive you, Lord. And we ask that each of those will grow in their knowledge and love for you. And we thank for one man in particular who's a drug addict who uh, really has now been set free from drugs and coming to you, know you, Lord Jesus. We rejoice also through Shekinah through the food ministry. They had four people last week open their hearts to receive you as well. Thank you. They're now in the Opportunity Center, a wonderful place with plenty of room and facilities to minister to people and provide the food that they need as well too, Lord. And Father, we thank you for our wonderful missionaries. We thank you for Jack and Kayleen Petra with New Life in Christ and Lakewood. Continue to anoint and bless them as they reach out in that community. And it's a very heavily Hispanic area, and they're reaching out to many drug addicts. People have been in prison. And thank you, many, many people have been set free from the bondage of of addiction and are now loving you very much. Bless their camps as they prepare their day camps for the summer, reach hundreds of children in that area too, and provide graciously for all their needs as well too, Lord. And for Jack and Kelly, we ask you to touch them because they each have physical needs at this time too, your healing presence as well too. We lift up Sitan Ronda Lee and your blessing upon them and the ministry of Transform Asia and Cambodia. Bless all the workers there to very much true. We lift up particularly the need for the resources to buy the rice for the rice distribution and the workers to make that possible later this summer as well. And Father, be healing upon Rhonda with her, her shoulder and, and Seton as he continues to battle with uh, just the injuries inflicted back in the killing fields with his feet and his legs as well. Lord. And we lift up David Matthews, anoint him with the power of your Holy Spirit and thank for his faithful witness to you in the Philippines and we lift up Legacy City that that ministry will continue to grow and with the churches with Leo and Fernando pastoring them on the islands and bless David as he moves back and forth for safety and the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon them as well. And lift up the Schumachers and bless their family as they minister and reach out here to Muslim families and see much fruit. We ask that it will be true around the world, Lord, through dreams and visions, through signs and wonders, the faithful witness of your people, Lord, that many millions of Muslims will hear the gospel and come to know you as Savior and Lord. And we lift up those who are Muslims and those who are Hindus and Jewish people who need to know you as Messiah as well. Draw them 
to yourself, Lord Jesus. We lift up the persecuted church, Lord. Many have lost loved ones, many in refugee camps, those are in prison. Just undergird them with the power of your Holy Spirit and keep them safe in your loving hands as well. And we lift up our troops and their families, those that serve in harm's way, and protect and guide them, especially those in Afghanistan, Lord. Give favor to our troops for working with our allies to defeat ISIS and Iraq and Syria, and just keep them safe. We thank our President, Commander-in-Chief, and Barack Obama. Bless he and his wife and family. Give them wisdom and divine guidance as well. And Father, help our President and our allies and, and our military resources to, to go to help Ukraine to maintain their sovereignty as well at this time, too. Lift up our President. He'll make wise decisions. He'll humble himself before you and truly repent of things that he teaches that are contrary to your word regard the sanctity of life and sanctity of marriage, too. Father, lift up Mike Kaufman. Bless he and his family and many others who know and love you and serve at all levels of government. Give them a sense of your presence and love and, and really to stand for things so that our nation can move back under your authority, Lord Jesus. And we lift up Pastor Doug and as you're anointing upon him as he pr uh, proclaims a word and shares about how we're to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us, Lord. And we ask your blessing on he and Carol and their whole family, keep them safe. And for Doug and Steve, as they prepare for their trip, Lord, just guide them in all their preparations, good health, safety, and travel. Go before them, Lord. Give them opportunities on the plane, wherever they go, to share the riches of your love. And as they're there to celebrate with us, the Institute has reached out now for 30 years and teaching English and at the same time introducing many of the Chinese students to you, Lord Jesus. And we bless their trip in all abundance, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you to the privilege now of giving back to you our tithes and offerings. And we do it with joy and gratitude for the blessings we receive. Take these gifts, multiply them many fold. The more we'll hear your name and come to know you as Savior and Lord. And now we pray together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
That was great, wasn't it? Isn't it a wonder? Did you, any of you lose any branches at home? I lost two biggies. And then last night as I was out late, um, trying to clear snow with a broom, um, I kind of had a picture of how God relieves pressure in our lives in worship. You know, the, um, oh, the branches were really sagging on some of the older trees that have been older 20 plus years. And they were just, and the more snow you got off, and they just kind of went like this, right? They just lifted. And uh, I think when we come into the presence of God in worship, uh, we're like sometimes from the week, we're just like this, right? And the Holy Spirit takes His Word and just clears the stuff off. And we go, wait, see? Huh? That's not a biblical parable. It's a Doug parable, but it's the parable of the snow on the branches. Huh? Very good. So, but it's true. I just thought about the weight, the weight that these trees are carrying. And of course, just like we have broken people in Denver, we have broken branches all over Denver that couldn't weather the storm. All right, enough of that. Sermon on the Mount, you ready to go to the gym and get in with God and say, whoa, we need a Savior. This is how you want us to live? Really? Wow, this goes against the grain for me. This is not normal. This is different. Yep, it sure is different. And the sermon is entitled, Living Like I've Been Loved. And uh, let's ask God to speak to us. Lord Christ, you are glorious and you are wonderful. You do lift the weight off our branches. And you clear the cobwebs off of our mind. And you take the guilt and the shame and the sin. And you free us. We come out so much lighter in your presence. <clears throat> And we, uh, we worship with a new sense of freedom. And we give our offerings with a new sense of gratitude. Not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So open our hands and open our hearts. And allow us to see Jesus in Him only. Amen. <clears throat> Loving your enemies is one of the hardest cells in the Bible. Amen? It is a very difficult thing to convince us of. And so I've chosen the title, Loving Like I've Been Loved, which I think is a more important title than Loving Like We're Forgiven. Because many Christians have such a narrow view of forgiveness. In other words, God sets the record straight, we're done, and we just go on our way. We're not just forgiven, we're loved and chosen in Him to be given the blessings of the kingdom. And that's a different matter. The Bible says, For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly, to bring us to God. And so the, today we look at this principle of loving people that we can't stand. Loving people that can't stand us realizing that one of the secrets is to, to recognize that our struggle is not against people, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And uh, so with that in mind, it's not always a person. There's more to it than meets the eye. So let's stand for the Word of God. It's, I didn't announce it. It's Matthew 5, 43 to 48. The last part of chapter 5. We're making it through the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said you shall love your enemy, excuse me, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Please be seated, and let's have some fun with this. Let's hear, and let's respond, and let's leave this place with a resolve to obey. To say, you know what? There's just things about my stubborn heart that have to change. And there's things that need to be addressed in my life. 
So I have three questions for you this morning. And so you'll answer no, but by the grace of God, you'll say, but I'm going to really endeavor by his grace to work on these. Now, this first question is that over a year period, are you becoming more or less like Jesus? You don't have to answer that out loud, but that's the goal over the last 12 months. And you'll know which way you're moving. Secondly, are we loving, are you loving those who don't love us? or who are very different from us. Now, I have to say, I don't do a good job of that, okay? So I'm in, I'm in need of a Savior here. But this is how Christ is asking us to live in His kingdom. And then thirdly, are we clinging to a righteousness that only God can provide? You must be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Nobody can do that on their own. That's the need of the glorious gospel. Are you ready now? Let's go. Number one. Are we becoming more or less like Jesus? Are you growing? Are you growing? Are the branches of your tree growing? Are the leaves sprouting? Is there fruit beginning to appear on the tree? Realizing that it's often two steps forward, one step back. And sometimes one step forward, two steps back. But this is impossible to live in your own strength. That's why we're talking about a supernatural kingdom. The Old Testament, which was there to put a rain on sin, to limit the spread of sin. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the reason why you do it, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You can't do this on your own strength. Remember we said last week, that if someone hits you with the back of the hand, the instinctive reaction is what? You're going down. Nobody gives me the back of their hand. And so there's this sort of a deeply ingrained nature that we won't be pushed around. We talked about what that really means. Now, many Christians wear those bracelets, what would Jesus do? Some of you have worn those at times. They were very popular maybe, what, five, ten years ago. They're okay, I think. I just think the question is the wrong question uh, because it pushes us without realizing it into a subtle form of moralism. Instead of saying, what would Jesus do? The question needs to be, what has Jesus done? What has Jesus done for me? And in light of that, now I can begin to make decisions that honor him. Because when I have to love my enemies and those who persecute me, there's nothing within me in the flesh that enables me to do that because I don't like so-and-so. Everybody has those so-and-sos in their life. I won't ask for an amen. But the Bible is saying this is what Christ's life looks like in us. We've entered a very different kingdom and come under his reign. And you know the old expression, don't you? Like father, like son, like two peas of a pod. You know, that whole thing. This is what it's saying. is the more you grow in your relationship with Jesus, you become more like Him. Look what it says in verse 45. So that you may be sons and daughters of your Father who is in heaven. And how does He act? He makes His sun shine on the evil and on the good, and He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God's common grace provision is what? granted not just to his covenant children, but to all people, simply because he is so gracious. And so the question comes up, doesn't it? Who is our neighbor? That question was asked to Jesus. But before we get to that, we realize that the, the Pharisees had built a system which they thought to be a proper interpretation of the book of Leviticus that dealt with this whole concept of love. Let me read just a little bit of it to you. You may want to jot this down. As you study the text here, you'll see that um, there were some very firmly entrenched notions. Leviticus 19, 17 to 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. 
but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, if I were to ask you, how does that compare to the New Testament? What's limiting about that? Do you remember what I just read to you? It says, you shall not bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. So what the Pharisees did, say, that's right. We'll love our own. We'll love, this is this way many American Christians behave. We'll love people that look like us and act like us and vote like us and smell like us. And we'll love people we're comfortable with. We'll love our own people. But our neighbor is those who look and dress like us. Our neighbor is those we approve of that are part of the club. But they overlooked Leviticus 19.34 where it says, you shall treat the stranger, that's the alien, the refugee, who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. Look at that, that sounds more like Jesus. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You were once an alien. You were once poor. You were once an outcast. You were once a refugee. So if you were to push these rascal Pharisees, they would say, of course we believe in loving our neighbor, except we limit in definition by nature who is our neighbor. Do you see that? I don't love those other kind of people. Does that sound familiar? And Jesus Christ burst it open. And the whole concept of your neighbor undergoes a radical transformation you must become more like your father who is in heaven how do you do that you do it by growing in grace by the word of God day in and day out as Christ is revealed to us and he shows us how to live and we stop imitating the world and we start imitating the father the son and the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Are you becoming more or less like Jesus? Now, don't answer that in a legalistic way. Well, I had a bad week. I'm done. No, no, no. That means you're trusting in your own salvation apart from Christ. But over the long haul, if you are rooted in Jesus Christ, there is such a transformation that is taking place from the inside out that we become and look more like Jesus Christ. Because the Father's work in us is to transform us into the image of Christ. Until what, you say? Until we die. And then we will take on the perfection of our Father without a sinful nature. Isn't that a beautiful thing to look forward to on a snowy Mother's Day? So, the answer is no here. Let's begin to worship Him together, because you will. Root yourself in the gospel. And recognize the evil one is going to whisper in your ear time and time again, you're no more like Jesus than you were a year ago. You're worse off. And remind you of every one of your sins. But in Christ, we are becoming more like him. And it goes against the very grain of the old nature. Okay, second principle. Of course, the answer is no to start here, okay? But it doesn't stay no. That's the beauty of the work of God. Are we loving those who don't love us? I don't do as a good a job of that as I should as a pastor. I love people who love me as a pastor. There, I confessed it. And uh, I have to do better at that. And I will do better by the grace of God. You see? For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. You see? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? See, the Pharisees had a double standard. They had one type of love for their neighbors, and they defined their people like us. And they had another for their enemies. It's easy to make anybody your enemy. And so Jesus took the principle and blows it up. You notice how he says over again, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, and we go, oh boy, here we go. But I say unto you. That's the whole Sermon on the Mount. The old covenant said this, and you think that's enough, but I say unto you. There it goes again, again and again and again. Well, you know what Jesus expounded on this, I hope, and we're not going to do a separate sermon other than to allude to it, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That was Christ's answer 
to the question, who is my neighbor? It's Luke 10, verse 25. Don't, you don't have to look it up, but I, I assume you know the story. And it's a ridiculously radical story of love because the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. It's like many of the Palestinians and the Jews today. It's just constant friction. But the Samaritans were especially hated by the Jews because they had remained in the land of Samaria after it had been taken by foreigners from Babylon. And they intermarried. And they, they really became a different ethnic group. And they had this huge tension with the Jews. And that's why when Jesus spoke to a woman at the well, he was where? He was in Samaria talking to a woman in public. You see how radical that is? But normally the Jews would go around Samaria. In America, what would that look like? We're not going through that neighborhood. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Or, or gang territory. That is not our turf. We can't stand those people. You people. But the Samaritans were considered less than human to the Jews. Okay? It was real racism. So what does Jesus do when he speaks to us about love and the kingdom of God? He speaks about the good Samaritan. And this could never have happened that a Samaritan would rescue a Jew. Unthinkable. Oh, so let's go. The road to Jericho outside of Jerusalem. The priest representing the priestly office of Israel passed by on the other side and he wouldn't get involved. Now there's some practical reasons not to get involved here. One of which the man was still alive, he was bleeding, he, he was well enough to be treated later and so we know that this incident had just happened, he had been robbed, he had been beaten and what does that mean? It means the robber's close by. We do the same in our, in our situation. We don't want to get too close to a fight at night. How many times do you hear in the news that somebody was mugged or a girl was raped and people just walk by? There is that deep desire for self-preservation. And so the priest walked by and said, well, concern, I better call 911, but I don't have a cell phone yet. We don't live in that time. And you see, and got to keep moving, got to keep moving. This is a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then the Levite, representing the Levitical priesthood in worship he too passed by on the other side of the road he might have said a prayer he might have said how are you bless you I hope I'll pray for you hope you get help hope you get hope hope you can make it but then a Samaritan comes by okay and please again appreciate the racial tension between the Jews and the Samaritans the Samaritans were those people despised by the Jews and the Samaritan comes over to the man bleeding. And of course, this is a picture of Christ for us, to us. He had compassion on him. And he went to him and he bandaged his wounds. And he took the oil that he had with him. And he treated those wounds. And he put him on his animal. He picked him up. And he risked his own safety. And he put him on his animal. And he took him to an inn. When he got there, he said to the innkeeper, here's two denarii, two days' wages, not only to cover his stay, but to cover his treatment and make sure he's all right and to intervene. And, uh, and Jesus said, well, that is what, who your neighbor is. You know what else he said? You go and do likewise. Oh, no. I'm going to be like, I'm in a hurry. I got appointments. I got to get to Faith Church. I see you guys. There's a guy there, but I got to get to Faith Church. He said, that is a picture of love. And by the way, the parable of the Good Samaritan, we'll, we'll do it again sometime, is a picture of the radical love of God in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was what? Ceremonially unclean. He was cast out into the city garbage dump. He was, he was despised. He became wretched. And he took on our sins in a horrible way, in a horrible place. And he became a Samaritan to the supposed religious people who desperately need a Savior. He, came, he comes to us. He picks us up out of our sin. And he pays the price for our salvation. And he bandages our wounds. And he sets us free. Do you see that? 
And he says, you become those same kind of people. Now, for the rest of our life, we will struggle with this text because the old nature says, I don't like people that don't like me. I don't like people that step on my big toe. I don't like people who insult me. Every one of us feels that way. But Jesus Christ says, you have to realize that if I live inside you and I indwell you, you will become more like me. My spirit will push you to love those who don't love you and who are different from you. I've been encouraging you to come on Friday nights to do the um, concert of prayer with Living Hope on the last Friday, and it's been the toughest sell I've had since I've been a pastor. Uh, the toughest of all. You mostly, it's, everything goes well, but this is a tough one. And I'm so committed to being, bringing people together who look different, act different, preach different, vote different, and yet we begin to see our neighbors in a new context. So just, that's not a political advertisement, but to see Faith Church, the importance of getting out of our box. Now, if you look at our building, and thank you, every time I see all the renovation going on around here, I thank God for you and your commitment to making this a place for all kinds of people. And if you want to know one of the reasons why our building has been run down, it's first of all, we've been tight on our budget for many years, but God has always provided. But secondly, we just house a lot of different kinds of people. I don't say that with pride. I say that as a kingdom opportunity, a refugee church, and, and the building just gets beat down. But I ask you as members of Faith Church, how do you want to be known? How do you want to be known? as a church who includes people and calls them neighbor and friend and who welcomes them into the body of Christ. Dare I ask for an amen? Uh, that was a mild one. <laughs> you see, that that's part of loving those who don't look like us. Tim Keller says the um, apologetic or the defense of the faith for the coming 10, 20, 30 years is an apologetic of compassion. But why does he say that? versus just an argument. It is an argument. It's a presentation of truth. But he says so many people are hardened to the Bible and church in general that when they see Christians loving people, when they see Christians loving people who disagree with them on political issues and extending the kindness of God to people, they go, whoa. When they see Christians feeding the poor and helping the refugee, that's why I want to encourage churches in Denver to get involved with the refugees of Denver. Don't turn your back. That's the heart of God. But when the secular people see that, they have this softening of the heart because it's none other than the love of God in Jesus Christ. Are we loving those who don't love us? You know, one of the things I would say to you after being here a long time is that we are learning to love each other. And some of you have loved me even when you haven't liked me. Yeah, think about that. I meant that. I'm not going to name names. Some of you have loved me even when you haven't liked me because you understand the importance of the body of Christ. And then after, you never know, you might like me. You see, but there's something about obeying Christ in this area. So, all right, we need a Savior right now. We're not doing good at this, but he, we're going to continue to change. Are we loving those who don't love us? We're going to do better because Christ will continue to work in us. Thirdly and finally, are we clinging to a righteousness that only God can provide? That's the beauty of the gospel. Now, if you read this text from any other perspective than that, you will become a moralist and you'll be beaten down and you'll leave church so fast. And it says in verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh boy, talk about discouragement. That's like saying you've got to shoot five under par every time you go out. Throw the clubs away. Right? I mean, that's ridiculous. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. St. Augustine said, and this is one of his greatest quotes, what God commands, God provides. Abraham needed a lamb, was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, and the great news is he found a lamb in the thicket. What God commands, God provides. What else does he say? You must be holy as I am holy. How many, how many people are as holy as God here? Now keep your hands down, thank you. Yep, but you become that how? 
through the righteousness of Jesus Christ that becomes yours. What God commands, God provides. Now, it also speaks in Scripture about perfect love casts out all fear. And God's love is perfect. His love towards us is when we were sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly, to bring us to God. And he loves us in our defilement, in our estrangement, in our filth, in our rebellion. And it's a perfect love that drives out my sin and cleanses me. And so we act differently than unbelievers. And if we're not, you must question whether Jesus Christ is in you. We act differently because our Savior is so different. As a matter of fact, He is holy. So if the Sermon on the Mount discourages you at time, that's a good thing. Because it's really a call to God's gymnasium. Come on. He's saying, wake up, faith church. Wake up. You've only got a few years in this earth. However many that is. Wake up and see the beautiful power of the kingdom. And he says, when you're overwhelmed and you say, I just can't love this person. I just can't do this. This is too hard. And by the way, you don't want to only read the Sermon on the Mount. Get into the Psalms too while I'm right next to it. But when you feel like you can't do well, you hear Jesus say to you, come unto me. All of you that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you my rest. And I will give you my peace. For my yoke is easy and my yoke is light. Do you see that? My burden is light. And he says to us, even when you guys were enemies of the cross, I loved you with a powerful love that set you free. Because of the fact that Christ loves me and that love changes my heart. It's a love that never will let me go. I can't be the same kind of person again. Oh, love, that'll never let me go. Amen? All right, Sermon on the Mount. Let it bug you all week. Let's go to the Lord now. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this Mother's Day and we could continue to work our way through this amazing sermon of Christ and, uh, and to see how different the kingdom of God is and to recognize our pettiness and how stubborn we are and yet how gracious you are to us. And so we continue to pray as we bow before you and we see the one who was beaten and disgraced and gambled over and slapped and uh, treated, mistreated by evil man. And yet did it through strength, not weakness. And did it for us. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, uh, this could be your morning. When you recognize your deep need for a Savior and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I need you. I need a Savior. I can't live the way you live. I can't be perfect because I see my sin everywhere. And yet I need the gospel. I need the glorious provision of Christ. I lay my life down before you. I confess my sins. And I receive Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And I receive him through the power of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in my soul. And I give you my sin, past, present, and future. And I receive from you your perfection, which I could never achieve. Your perfect righteousness that sets me free. If you prayed that prayer, you've entered the kingdom of God. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Jesus, we thank you that you continue to love us when we uh, do just the opposite of what you've called us to do. We thank you for this word of God that raises us up and sends us forth with a renewed challenge. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
great job. Spirit Wind on Mother's Snow Day. All right, let's take the hand of the person standing next to us. Reach across the aisle. Do you think we'll get any snow in June? You never. I said we wouldn't get it in May. That's how little of a prophet I really am. I was wrong, but I didn't gamble any money on it, so I'm okay. All right, we pray for one another. You pray for me and, and Steve and the trip for the time on the plane, which drives us nuts, and the um, time of me breathing that air in Beijing. I have two masks, two pollution masks. My son get two, said get two in case the first one wears out. And uh, I often have trouble with polluted air, so you have to pray for me that way. I'm not going to do any walking in the city or any of that stuff. I want to be healthy to see what God will show me so that I can share with you the amazing miracle of people coming to Christ in China, which is one of the great stories of the kingdom. That's what I'm hoping to do, but I need to be healthy to do it. So let's pray one for another. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord pour out his love into your heart and on you that you would amaze yourself by loving those who are very unloving and that they would see the love of Christ now and forevermore. Amen and amen.